The record should show that the jury has returned to open court. Uh, counsel and Mr. Burns are also present. Uh, we are ready to hear from the state's next witness. State call Stacy Prawl. Good afternoon. You're headed right over to the chair with the red seat. Please pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. And I will acquaint you with just a couple of rules in the courtroom. Uh, please wait until the attorneys have finished the question before you begin your answer. They will do the, give you the same courtesy of, of waiting until you have finished before they ask the next question. Uh, and please be aware of that microphone. We want to make sure that we can all hear your testimony. That's why you're here. Uh, and if you would please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names for the record. My name is Stacy Prall, S-T-A-C-I-E-P-R-A-L-L. -L. Thank you. You may conduct your uh, direct examination, Mr. Maybanks. Thank you, Your Honor. What is your current occupation? I'm an evidence technician with the Division of Criminal Investigation at the Criminalistics Lab in Ankeny, Iowa. How long have you done that? I have been there since 2005. Do you work with uh, the other lady who testified today, uh, this morning, Nicole Kaufman? I do. <clears throat> she told us a little bit about the uh, duty of an evidence technician. Does she have the, uh, the same title and position as you? She does. And she also told us uh, about the procedures and protocol that is used at the laboratory to ensure that um, items that are received by outside agencies are handled with the proper care to ensure the integrity of the items. Uh, are you and she trained with, um, in those same procedures and protocol? We are. <clears throat> may I approach witness, Your Honor? You may. Explain the witness what's been uh, previously marked and discussed by other witnesses as uh, State's Exhibit 11A and ask you if that's a document with which you're familiar. It is. And the State's Exhibit 11A have your uh, name indicated on it as uh, evidence tech receiving some uh, evidence from the Sea Rapids Police Department. It does. Does this indicate that uh, in your capacity as the evidence tech at the DCI laboratory you received items on October 30th of 2018 that are described herein? That is correct. And do those items uh, refer to lab numbers 49, 50, 51, 52, and 53? That is correct. And um, have you had an opportunity to check your other documentation as it relates to this case? I have. And in collaboration or in a combination with uh, this document and the other uh, documentation, uh, did you find that all the proper procedures and protocol were handled to ensure the safekeeping of these items when they were checked into the laboratory pending mm -hmm. the uh, testing by criminals? Yes, they were. Witness again, Your Honor. You may. <clears throat> Again, the witness what's been marked as uh, State's Exhibit 11B, which also has been previously discussed in these proceedings. And I'll, I'll ask you, Ms. Prawl, uh, do you recognize this document? I do. And does this also contain uh, your name on it as an evidence technician that received? evidence at the DCI laboratory on the uh, date mentioned therein? I, it does. And uh, does that indicate that those items, um, where that item was received on October 26 of 2018 uh, with a lab number of 48? That is correct. And have you had a chance again to um, check your documentation with regards to this case to ensure that in connection with this document that all that, that item was handled appropriately to ensure the integrity of it while checking it in pending the uh, testing by the criminals. I have. And has were all the proper procedures followed? That you could tell. Yes, they were.
That's all I have for this witness at this time, Your Honor. Cross-examination, Mr. Spies. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Prawl. Hello. Ms. Prawl, uh, other documents that have been examined uh, during the course of our trial here have referred to uh, custody logs. And you know what I'm talking about. I do. And custody logs maintained at the Division of Criminal Investigation show when an item is checked in, when it's checked out to be examined by a criminalist or another investigator, when it's returned to uh, uh, your custody or the custody of another evidence technician. You're familiar with what I'm talking about? I am. And these uh, custody logs document down to the minute and the date, of course, when something is uh, received into uh, your custody or the custody of the evidence technician when it's checked out, when it's returned, transported, down to the minute. They, yes, they do. And uh, would you consider that to be the, the standard of care in the handling of, of evidence in criminal cases? Um, that's how our system is set up. So any time that evidence is transferred from one person to another, um, there is a time stamp, um, stuff like that. And similarly, uh, it would not be good investigative practice to leave items of evidence unattended, unexplained, or unaccounted for. Could you repeat the question? Sure. It would not be good investigative practice to leave items of evidence unaccounted for missing. I would agree with that. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for you. Anything further, Mr. Maybanks? Uh, Ms. Prawl, when, um, for example, in this case and other cases similar to this, when you receive the item of evidence from the law enforcement department and place it for safekeeping, um, pending the uh, criminalist uh, reviewing it, are, is there someone who's with that 24-7, uh, or does it just remain in that safe place until checked out again? So when the evidence comes into the lab, it's given a barcode, and that's when that timestamp is generated. Um, that evidence, that piece of evidence, has a barcode on it, and then it's tracked throughout the lab. Some days it could be on a shelf waiting for the criminalist to request it. Um, other days it could be in somebody's custody. Um, if it's in the shelf, that's within um, a locked room within a locked laboratory, within a, within a secure laboratory. So um, if it's in our evidence vault or there's not very much access that's able to get to that piece of evidence. <clears throat> when an item of evidence is in the custody of uh, the governmental agency, the Division of Criminal Investigations Laboratory, is there a documentation to show that that's where it remains um, until it leaves the facility? That is correct. That's all I have, Your Honor. Anything further from this witness, Mr. Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. State may call its next witness. Your Honor, prior to uh, calling our next witness, the parties in this case reached a stipulation in regards to uh, a witness's testimony. I hope I got this marking right, but I marked it as 19 and uploaded it. State's 19. <clears throat> but it was been signed by myself, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Spees. Um, a stipulation regarding Ron Johnson, who was a prior witness in this case, and uh, State's Exhibit 11B, which uh, has been discussed and will be further discussed. Mr. Spees, any comments regarding, shall we call it Joint Exhibit 19? That was going to be my proposal, Your Honor, yes. Aside from that, no other comments. Okay. Uh, the court will uh, receive, and to the, to the extent that I am able, designated as a joint um, exhibit, that being the, the second uh, stipulation that the parties have reached, uh, a number 19. Um, and then I, do you want to read that or publish that, Mr. Maybanks? Uh, yes, I will go ahead and read it with the permission of the court. Okay. And so, sorry, it, the, the exhibit will be received and made part of the record. Go ahead, Mr. Maybanks. Comes now the state of Iowa by and through uh, the undersigned first assistant Lynn County attorney, Nicholas G. Maybanks, assistant Lynn County attorney, Michael Harris, and counsel for defendant Leon Spees, and submit upon agreement 
following stipulation in lieu of testimony from Ron Johnson, Cedar Rapids Police Identification Officer. On October 26, 2018, uh, submitted the following item, lab number 48, agency number K, B as in boy, one, to Stacy Prawl, DCI lab as set forth in States Exhibit 11B. This witness followed the proper protocol for delivery and transfer of items as required by the Cedar Rapids Police Department in the Division of Criminal Investigations Laboratory to ensure no altering, substitution, or tampering occurred to the item described as a, quote, straw Kenneth Burns drank with, very close quote. Thank you, Mr. Maybanks. With that, we can call our next witness if the court. Uh, yes, you may. Permits, um, Michael Schmidt. Good afternoon. We're headed right around the front of the bench here, over to the witness chair with the red seat. <coughs> if you please pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Go ahead and be seated. As you get situated, there are just a couple of things I want to remind you about in the courtroom. Uh, as, the, as the attorneys ask you questions, please allow them to finish the question, even if you have an idea where the question will end up. Uh, and then take a breath before you begin your answer. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to hear you as well as the attorneys. They will return the favor by not asking a question before you finish the answer on the preceding question. Also, there's a microphone in front of you. Be mindful of that so that we're all able to hear you as you testify. And last but not least, if you'd please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names for the record. My name is Michael Nathan Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T. And Michael, M-I-C-H. M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Thank you, sir. Sure. You may proceed with your examination, Mr. Maybanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Schmidt, first, who are you employed by? I am a criminalist. I work for the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation Criminalistics Laboratory in Ankeny, Iowa. How long have you been so employed? Since June of 1998. You told us your current position as a criminalist. Can you describe what duties you have as a criminalist for the Division of Criminal Investigations Laboratory. I work in the DNA section of the crime lab. My job is to look at items of evidence collected from crime scenes. And I'll examine those items, usually looking for blood or seminal fluid, semen, sperm, saliva, um, any biological substance where we may be able to develop a DNA profile from that sample. Um, and Besides looking at items of crime scene evidence, I will look at known samples, uh, known blood samples or known mouth swabs, known buckle samples from uh, victims and, and suspects in crimes, and try to make comparisons between the profiles developed from the victims or the suspects and compare those to the samples collected from the crime scenes and to see if the samples match or if we can make an elimination. Do you also um, engage in um, putting certain profiles that are developed from known samples or uh, samples from evidence at crime scenes and placing them into the uh, state database or the Iowa portion of CODIS? That's correct. And can you explain a little bit about that process and what you do? Um, in some cases, the police don't always have uh, a suspect. Um, they don't know who committed the crime. Um, right now, we have a, a national database, and um, it links all 50 states. Uh, there are DNA databases in, in the 50 states. Um, and so if we have a, a DNA sample from a crime scene, we don't know who committed the crime, or the police have a suspect and they're eliminated, we can put that profile into the database to see if it matches either samples left at other crime scenes or samples of uh, people convicted of crimes 
unrelated crimes, or we can see if those samples match crime scenes or convicted offenders or people that are arrested in other states. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Be handing the witness what's been marked as uh, State's Exhibit CV3, Sub 1. <coughs> Mr. Schmidt, what is that document? Um, this is my statement of qualifications. It just uh, lists the continuing education I've had since I've been employed at the DCI Crime Lab. Does this, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, also, where I attended college, um, approximately how many cases I've testified in, presentations I've given, um, basically resume items. Does this contain a, a fair and accurate rundown of your statements of, or statement of qualifications to testify as a, an expert on DNA profiling and DNA analysis? Yes. Move to enter state CV3, Your Honor. Any objection to CV31? No objection, Your Honor. CV31 will be received and made part of the record. Mr. Schmidt, we have uh, the CV31 for the jury to reference further in the case. However, um, while you're on the stand, I want to ask you just a couple of questions about your background so we know more about you. First, uh, tell us about your educational background. I graduated from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology in May of 1997. I also had minors in chemistry and psychology. Uh, after graduation, I had an internship at the Iowa DCI lab in the drug section of the lab. This was an unpaid internship. And I worked there that summer and then in, at the DCI headquarters doing computerized criminal history background checks for nursing home and, and job applicants until they had a full-time position come available in the crime lab in June of 1998. And I've been in the DNA section at, of the crime lab since then. Can you provide to us a summary of the specialized training that you've had and that you've received in forensic DNA analysis? We're required to get at least eight hours of continuing education um, every year uh, for forensic DNA analysis. And I've gone usually um, to regional forensic meetings. Um, a lot of those are hosted by the Midwestern Association of Forensic Scientists. There's also a private lab in Missouri called the Paternity Testing Corporation. And regional labs um, from Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Midwestern states usually attend these meetings, and there are speakers there from large crime lab systems like the Missouri State Patrol or the Michigan State Police, and they will present uh, the latest techniques and uh, DNA kits that we use in forensic DNA testing. Your Honor, may I encourage the witness to uh, either attend to or bring the microphone a little bit closer to him? Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Sure. Thank you. Turning to your uh, CV, uh, that states exhibit CV31 that's been received into evidence, do um, the first pages, I believe, maybe, maybe one through five, uh, provide a summary of the ongoing training that you've received in DNA forensic analysis as well as other areas? Yes. Can you point um, us to a few examples of the training that you've received, in particular some of the more recent trainings you've received that have contributed to the analysis that you've done in this case. Okay, in January of 2017, um, we had training on our armed expert DNA mixture and statistics software training. That's currently what we're using um, to report random match statistics when we make a DNA match. Um, also in 2018, I went to Madison, Wisconsin 
Um, it's, it was called the ProMega Tech Tour. ProMega is a corporation that provides some of the DNA testing kits that the forensic community uses. They had uh, speakers there from the California Department of Justice, um, the Johnson County, Kansas Police DNA Lab, and various other forensic labs giving presentations on the latest DNA techniques and, and items that we can use. And are those um, but just two examples then of the type of training you've received in uh, conducting modern DNA forensic analysis? Yes. Okay. Do you perform uh, DNA analysis for a variety of criminal investigations? Yes. The majority of the cases I work now are sex assaults and death investigations, but we also do burglaries, robberies, um, sometimes body identifications and uh, theft cases, vehicle thefts. Does that sometimes involve working on cold case homicides? Yes. Was there a period of time with the DCI where you were assigned, uh, I guess I wouldn't say exclusively, but primarily to cold case homicides? Yes, from 2009 until 2012, my job was to basically work cold cases. I was also on call for the, the crime scene team at the time, so that wasn't everything I did, but it was at least 70 to 75 percent <laughs> of the work at the time. After 2012, has that work on cold case homicides continued on a um, kind of case-by-case -case basis? The cold cases are now spread a lot more throughout the section, the DNA section. Right now we have 21 people in the DNA section. Well, not that many people work in cases, but uh, the, the casework section combined with the DNA database section, we now have 21 people. Back in 2009, there were only about nine or 10 people working cases, and I was the one specifically assigned to cold cases. Now we, we spread those out more evenly among the case workers in the lab. Based on how the um, DCI crime lab assigns cases, can you tell us um, you know, what their method is to assign criminalists like you to uh, certain cases that may uh, be prolonged in the investigative stages or may not result in an immediate sort of like um, prosecution, I guess? Um, in the past, uh, the, the casework assignments were basically made at the beginning of each month. And if you had a backlog of cases, you probably wouldn't get a really huge time-consuming case. Um, we try to spread those around and to try and make the individual backlogs even. Right now, we have a different case assignment system. We're only working about five to 10 cases at, at any given time. And um, we're able to get those cases out a lot quicker than we could in the past. Um, but at the time I was assigned this case, uh, it was just, uh, it could have been assigned to anybody. They, my supervisor decide, decided to assign it to me. There were a, a group of cases that were split up and divided throughout the section, and this is one of the cases that I received. It would have been about 2016. So you just got lucky? Um, not really. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Schmidt, uh, are your analysis methods at the laboratory uh, accepted and used by other forensic DNA laboratories across the uh, nation? Yes, the FBI sets the rules for, for what loci or what areas on the human DNA, DNA genome that we're going to analyze. Right now, they've selected about 20 STR loci that each lab is supposed to develop results for, and for eligible profiles, enter that data into the, the national database. In the past, it was only 13 different locations we were looking at. Um, earlier in, in, in this case, we were looking at 13 to 15 different locations. Now we're looking at 21 different locations. What about the um, kits that you use from the manufacturer? Uh, can you g give us kind of a, a, a summary or a description of um, those that you use that were related to this case and whatnot? In the past, there have been two or three companies that pretty much manufacture all the DNA kits used by at least the, the United States uh, government-funded crime labs. Um, ProMega is one of the companies, and Thermo Fisher is the other one. Kyogen also makes a kit that, that has the current 21 low side that we use. 
Um, we have a state bidding process. Uh, the, the kit that was selected for use at the DNA lab went through that bidding process, and so we ended up with the Global Filer Kit, which is made by the Thermo Fisher Company. In the past, um, previous analysis on this case used uh, a kit from the ProMega Corporation, which was called PowerPlex 16. Okay. Have you ever testified as an expert witness uh, in forensic DNA analysis? Yes. How often do you testify as an expert witness? On average, about two trials per year. There are additional cases that make it to a deposition stage, of, um, but um, a lot of these cases are either pushed back or, or are settled or plead out. According to your um, CV, state CV 31, looks like in state court since March of 2000, you testified in 74 cases, is that right? Give me page five, I believe. Yes, and that's not 74 trials, that's 49 trials and then 51 depositions, 74 cases in all. Um, like I said earlier, not every case that I testify on a deposition makes it to the trial stage. In when you testify as a uh, expert witness in the realm of DNA, have you ever had any uh, issues or concerns qualifying as an expert witness? No. If someone disagrees with your DNA results, is there a scientific way to check your work? Yes, uh, the FBI requires us to retain or return part of every sample that we test. So, for example, if there's a blood stain on an item, I'm not going to cut the entire blood stain and test it. I'm only going to test a portion of that, usually half or less. Ha I'm sorry, half or less of the actual stain that I will consume in my DNA testing. That way, uh, if there are questions later on, and, and the defense has the option to take what's left of that stain and send it to a lab of their choice, or do what they want with the evidence. And are the records that you compile as a result of your uh, testing and analysis also retained at the laboratory for review by, um, by defendants or by other individuals that want to check your work? Yes, uh, we often have to fulfill discovery requests. We'll make a copy of our case file and all the papers we have for a case and release it to the county attorney who in turn gives it to the defendant for examination. And to your knowledge, has your work ever been reviewed by an outside agency like a laboratory or criminalist like yourself? Yes. Have your DNA test results ever um, resulted in eliminating a suspect in a criminal investigation? Yes. Mr. Schmidt, you're the third criminalist we've heard from. And I asked the other two this question as well, and it should be an easy one. I want you to tell us, what is DNA? Okay. DNA um, is a molecule that's found in the nucleus of just about every, every cell in your body. Uh, every cell that has a nucleus is going to have DNA in that nucleus. You get half of your DNA from your mother and the other half from your father. Um, and we're looking at enough different locations. Um, in the past it was 13, now we're 21 different locations in the DNA profile that we're able to, to tell differences between people. Um, we're able to eliminate DNA you know, as coming from a defendant or a victim if we compare enough different locations. Um, Mr. Schmidt, did you uh, provide um, our office, myself and um, the others at this table, a, um, a demonstrative type of exhibit that um, would allow you to better explain to um, laypersons or, for example, jurors about the what you're looking at when you look at a uh, DNA uh, molecule and the helix and whatnot? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may I use the uh, dem demonstrative exhibit uh, that has uh, been provided and shown to Mr. Spees before today? If, Mr. Spees, have you had an opportunity to review, review the demonstrative aid? I have, yes. Do you have any objection to the state use? I that? do not. Okay. You may, Mr. Maybanks. Okay. Yeah. 
Shorts. And if you need to come down here too, that okay. feels pretty helpful. <laughs> ask you then, um, tell us just kind of what we're looking at here in terms of the DNA molecule and guide us into how you use um, these features to be able to conduct your analysis in terms of um, identifying profiles and comparison. Your body is made up of cells. Wait a minute. I, I, I'm going to have to move down to the Okay. I can move that there if you want. That'd be great. Oh, here? Please. Yep, absolutely. Please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have to witness to stand on the other side so we can see what <laughs> It's a tug of war between you and Ms. Thompson. Yeah. If I can move it. Absolutely. <coughs> okay, I think we're ready for you, Mike. Okay. Your body is made up of cells. And in the nucleus of the cell, that's where the DNA is going to be located. Um, these are chromosomes. This is on a very small, this is blown up, this microscopic level. Um, chromosomes, so you have 23 from your mother and 23 from your father. So you have 46 chromosomes in the cell. Um, this is blow up of chromosome. And if you keep going down, getting smaller and smaller, zooming in on the chromosome, you'll see that it's eventually becoming a double helix, which is the shape of the DNA ladder. Um, and that double helix is made up of bases, um, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. Um, now, if you look at the letters T, G, C, A, thymine, guanine, cytosine, adenine, for short, um, we're looking at differences in the length of these segments of DNA. Um, we use a process called PCR that makes many copies of certain areas of the DNA, enough copies so that the instrument we use can detect um, a person's DNA. And with, and with computers, we're able to put together a DNA profile of that person. Mike, we use different um, uh, language inside the reports and throughout this trial. But in terms of, you know, if we call this a, a ladder here, uh, the rung of the ladder, or the area where the rung of the ladder is, what's that referred to? Well, the, the ladder is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone on the outside, and then um, bases on the inside. And what are the measurements that are uh, that you're taking in here? What are those referred to? Right now, we're looking at short tandem repeats. That's repeating short sequences of DNA. For example. Uh, T G C A G T. Now this is this can be repeated a number of times, and depending on the number of times it's being repeated in the sequence, um, there are going to be differences from person to person. Like one person might have this sequence repeat three or four times, and then another person could have it repeat seven times. And so that's we're we're looking at small differences in the length of DNA between each individual. In terms of the. Uh terminology we've heard involving a loci and allele, how does that fit into uh, the DNA molecule and the <coughs> process you're explaining? Loci is plural for locus, which is, and a locus is a location. And it's a location somewhere in the genome, somewhere on this chromosome. Uh, somewhere in all these chromosomes, right now we're looking at about 20 different locations and measuring the, the, the differences at those locations between people. 
And then what is the allele in terms of that? An allele is basically a DNA factor. Um, for each of the 20 locations we're looking at, you get one DNA factor or one DNA allele from your mother, and the other DNA allele comes from your father. So when you're uh, performing the analysis and you complete your report, do you refer to your findings in terms of um, conducting a measurement of the alleles at each loci that you're examining? We're looking at the, the alleles at each loci. Um, not everybody's going to have the same allele at, at all the loci that we look at. If you look at enough different locations, you may have people that match at six or seven or sometimes even eight loci. But if you look at 13 or 15 or 20 loci, they are not going to match at every single one of those loci, with the exception of identical twins. Identical twins will have the same DNA profile. All right, thanks, Mike. I think that's enough for now. Mike, you explained to us a little bit about the uh, PCR, STR method of analysis for DNA profiling. How did that, uh, the emergence of that, lead to changes and improvement in DNA forensics? Um, in, the, in the early days of DNA, uh, the process of developing a DNA profile from a, a crime scene item, uh, it took a long time. Is very labor intensive. Um, they use what's called restriction fragment length polymorphism. And that was basically just taking the blood stain that was there and trying to get DNA from it. Um, in about the, the early 1990s, at least at the DCI, we used the polymerase chain reaction. It wasn't just looking at the DNA that was present in a blood stain, it was taking that DNA and making millions and billions of copies of the DNA that, that may be present in the stain. So we were able to detect um, DNA in samples with the new PCR technology that you couldn't previously with the restriction, the RFLP technology you're able to basically have a lot less DNA and be able to develop a profile from it compared to years past. So in terms of um, something maybe we can all relate to in layman's terms, um, could you compare what you're able to see through this uh, PCR, STR, uh, method of amplification to, um, for example, what uh, we would be able to look for and have seen in terms of satellite images of Earth from a long distance away? Um, if you have one brick, you're not going to be able to see it um, if you're sitting on top of a satellite, you know, looking down on the Earth. Um, but if you take millions of copies of that brick and make something like the Great Wall of China that's hundreds of miles long and made, I don't know how many bricks, but a lot, um, you are able to see something like that from space. And that's kind of like what we have with our DNA analysis instruments. When we make enough copies of the DNA that are in a certain sample, then usually that's enough to be detected by the instrumentation that we're currently using in the crime lab. So you've used um, the STR or the PCR STR process, done the amplification, um, developed profile um, by conducting the analysis and making the requisite measurements and, stu and such. When those profiles are, are developed and compared, uh, how are the results reported in terms of uh, statistics in order to help explain the significance of those findings? In, in our DNA reports, we'll say that 
the DNA um, either matches a sample from a suspect or a victim, or we'll say that they're eliminated. Um, but we're not allowed to just simply say that the DNA from the crime scene matches the suspect. We also are required uh, by the state Supreme Court to give a statistical statement uh, about the match. And right now, we're using the random match probability. That's one of the acceptable statistical uh, calculations that are used throughout the United States, one of the acceptable methods that the FBI allows us to use. What does that mean, the random match probability statistics? OK, if I have a, a sample that matches a person, and, and I'm going to pull at random somebody from the population uh, of unrelated individuals, the chances of me pulling another person that would have a, that matching, that same matching profile would be one you know, out of 100 billion. It'd be a very small number, or a very small chance that I'm going to pull at random somebody that's going to have a matching profile as that which was found at the crime scene. Thank you. How does the DCI lab ensure uh, that the statistics you report are um, scientifically based on uh, generally accepted principles in the field of DNA? Uh, the random match probability has been in use in the forensic community, um, especially, by, especially by crime labs in the United States since at least the 1990s. Is your laboratory uh, required to maintain uh, standards including adherence to, strict adherence to these um, FBI promulgated and um, uh, statistical analyses in order to maintain your accreditation? Yes, uh, the FBI requires that all forensic DNA labs be audited annually. And every other year, that audit needs to be conducted by an external agency or, or uh, basically an outside crime lab or an outside uh, private organization that has qualified individuals that are able to do a forensic DNA audit. <clears throat> when DNA um, is isolated from a, in a crime, from a crime scene and a profile is identified, uh, how can you be assured through your process that the loci you're examining uh, in the allele you're measuring come from the same strand or the same individual? At each of the locations that we're looking at, I would, if, if the DNA was only coming from one person, I would expect to see one peak or two peaks. Um, and th these are the factors or alleles I was mentioning earlier. You get one from your mother and one from your father. Now, if your mother and father have the, that same allele, like a, a five allele, then you're only going to see one peak. But if your mother has a five allele and your father has a six allele, then you're going to see two peaks, one for the five and one for the six. So I'd only expect to see two peaks at the low side that we're looking at. Um, if there's going to be three peaks or four peaks or five peaks, that's a clue that there's DNA there from more than one person. If you were to uh, obtain a crime scene or analyze a crime scene sample and develop a profile and there were um, substantially uh, substantial number of areas where there was more than two peaks, would that then not be presumed to be an individual profile? Usually, yes. Um, we usually require more than, than one locus to have more than two peaks. Um, but if, if you're having several loci where there are three peaks, then you're probably looking at a mixture of DNA from two people, at least. In your role as a criminalist uh, at the DCI laboratory, did you receive evidence from the Sea Rapids Police Department in connection with the homicide investigation, the victim of Michelle Martinko, that took place on December 19th, 1979? Yes. And was that, uh, uh, how long was that your case, or how did that become your case, if you remember? Uh, it was assigned to me in 2016. Who had that before you, do you remember? Amy Polpeter. And who else worked on it? Uh, Paul Bush and Linda Sauer and Mike Peterson. Uh. 
And when you were assigned that case in 2016 through 2017 into the fall of 2018, did you uh, complete some reports um, involving uh, DNA analysis and comparison before you received the straw that was used by Jerry Burns? Yes, I did. Okay. And did that involve eliminating numerous uh, potential individuals as the source for the suspect male DNA profile from uh, stain F5? Yes. Explain, if you would, um, so we know how the laboratory is able to affirmatively eliminate a, uh, an individual as being the uh, contributor or the uh, person donating the uh, suspect profile. When Linda Sauer looked at this case in 2005, uh, she determined uh, the crime scene profile, the allele calls made in that particular profile. She documented those allele calls in a worksheet that we use in the crime lab that, that calculates the statistics for us. So when the years passed and uh, various persons of interest, known samples from those people were sent to me to either try to include or eliminate to the crime scene profile. I was able to do that because Linda had already determined what the crime scene profile was. So all I had to do was develop DNA profiles from known samples from possible suspects and compare those to the work that Linda Sauer did. And so at, when you're performing that work, how do you reach a point where you feel with uh, confidence you can say that a certain suspect is eliminated? That a suspect would, unless they're matching at every single location that we have results for, they're going to be eliminated. Conversely, um, how do you reach a finding um, in the laboratory that a suspect cannot be eliminated? In order to, to not be eliminated, the known DNA profile from that individual would have to match all of the results that were developed from the crime scene profile at all of the loci. So did you perform um, many comparison tests um, that resulted in eliminating individuals as sources of the crime team profile F5 in this case? Yes. Okay. Were you involved in some discussions with uh, investigator Matt Denlinger uh, regarding um, ideas for developing more potential leads for uh, suspects? Uh, I was not really in the initial stages of the, of the investigation. Uh, Matt communicated with my supervisor, Paul Bush, about that. Were you aware of the discussions between Matt and Paul? Yes. Okay. Were you aware that um, Matt was consulting with Parabon uh, involving uh, developing suspects? Yes. And was this being done with the blessing of the DCI crime lab? Yes. That's not something you guys were able to do at that time. No, right. and we, we still can't. We don't have that technology in place at the Iowa Crime Lab. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that answer. We don't have that technology in place at the Iowa Crime Lab. Is that something you might be able to get if the legislature decides to fund it? Uh, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> I'm trying to get, let you get, do a pitch here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with enough money, um, you know, I think anything's possible as far as that goes. Good answer, Mike. Thanks. Um, well, I want to get into some of your findings, but first I want to ask if you did some additional work at the laboratory to see whether any of the crime scene evidence that was already there and had been analyzed uh, had been tested, profiled, and determined whether it could be matched to any of the profiles that had been developed. Did you do some of that work? Yes. And with respect to an item previously described as item J, it's a hair root uh, found on a screw inside the vehicle. Did you have an opportunity to compare that, uh, the profile from the hair root to an individual's known pro profile in the case? Yes, I did. And did you find a profile to match that hair root? Yes. You remember who that was? That was Michael Weirich. I believe that comes from report 28. 
the partial DNA profile, 10 out of 15 STR loci, developed from the hair root item J, was consistent with the known DNA profile of Michael Weirich. The probability of finding this profile in a population of unrelated individuals chosen at random would be less than 1 out of 4.2 billion. Thank you. By October of uh, 2018, had you received um, numerous items of evidence of discarded uh, items from individual collected for purposes of um, attempting to develop a profile and compare it to the um, crime scene profile F5? Yes. Any of the witness what uh, has been marked and previously discussed as State's Exhibit 11A. You have your own copy there, Mike? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize uh, State's Exhibit excuse me, 11A? Yes. This is, a, this is a DNA report I issued on November 5th of 2018. And was this report uh, completed upon the request of the Cedar Rapids Police Department to examine a straw used by an individual identified to you or on this report as Jerry Lynn Burns for the presence of DNA? Yes. Was this report made uh, at or near the time you analyzed this straw to develop a profile for comparison? Yes. And was it uh, this report then completed at or near the time of November 5th of 2018? Yes, it was. When you completed the report, did you have knowledge of the matters contained therein? I, yes, I knew what I wrote in the report. Um, and is this a record kept in the regular course of business activity at the DCI Criminalistics Laboratory? Yes. Is it still practiced to keep and maintain these records? Yes. Does this appear to be a fair and accurate copy of your report dated 11-5-2018? I believe it's report 39. Yes, it is. And would uh, this report be helpful for, to be able to explain your testimony regarding your findings? Yes. Explain, if you would, the process uh, that you used to complete the examination, uh, first of lab number uh, 49, agency number J, B as in boy, one, described as the straw collected immediately after being used by Jerry Burns. For DCI item 49, which was a straw that was reportedly collected and or used by Jerry Burns, uh, the weak DNA profile developed from the ends of the straw indicated a male source. The DNA donor could not be eliminated as the major contributor to the DNA profile previously developed from stain number F5 on DNA report dated December 5th of 2005 from the black dress described as item F1 on the DNA report dated September 8th of 2003. I went on to say that further interpretation may be attempted if a known DNA sample from a potential source is submitted. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Um, did you um, use the PCR, um, STR short, the, the process of examining this item? Yes, I did. Okay. In if you could just kind of give us a, a general idea of how that was done. I, in the lab, I took the straw and I took a, a swab, which is basically a, a Q-tip with cotton on the end. I have sterile water that's DNA-free that I put on that swab, and I'll swab the straw, attempting to swab up any cells that may be on the ends of the straw. Um, sometimes I know which end of the straw the suspect used because sometimes the police have a... a, a plastic cup lid and you know so you swab the end of the straw that's up but sometimes we don't and so sometimes we'll just swab both ends of the straw to, that way we're, we're covered um, and then I'll take a cutting of that swab and develop a DNA profile from it and compare it to Linda's uh, results from 2005 And was the same process uh, that you just described used to uh, examine um, the other item on this, item 53? Um, well, one of the other items on this, item 53, agency number 
D, B as in boy, one, D as in dog, the toothbrush collected from Donald Murren's garbage? Yes, DCI item 53 was a toothbrush collected from the garbage of Donald Burns. The DNA profile developed from the toothbrush bristles indicated a male source, and the DNA donor of this profile was eliminated as the major contributor to the DNA profile previously developed from stain number F5 of the dress. So the toothbrush, um that was identified as connected to Don was eliminated. The DNA that developed from that was eliminated as a source for F5, but the straw used by Jerry Burns could not be eliminated. That's right. Okay. Move to enter uh, 11A, Your Honor. Have you had an opportunity to review 11A? I have, Your Honor, yes. Do you and have no any? objection? Okay. 11A will be received and made part of the record without objection. Motion to publish, Your Honor. You may. go ahead and go to the results section under 49 and I um, believe you read for us uh, the results of your examination here um, again this indicates that the uh, weak DNA profile developed from the ends of the straw indicated a male source uh, so you were able to confirm that the um, this was male DNA on the straw right yes okay and the DNA donor could not be eliminated as a major contributor to the DNA profile previously developed from stain number five uh, from the black dress. Some notes to previous reports there. Um, I want to ask you, Mike, after the work he had done on this case up till that point, uh, what was your initial response when you were interpreting these results? Um, at this point, I'd had probably at least 30 people that I already eliminated as being a, a DNA donor to the, the stain on the dress. Um, when I came to this straw um, and I was making matches at each of the loci that we had results for, I, I, it, was, it was kind of unbelievable, um, you know, that the type of technology to get us to this point even existed. It seemed kind of science fiction to me. But yet, the results are right in front of you. Yes. Okay. As you went down that profile, did you um, begin to come to the conclusion that um, this required some additional investigation? Yes, that's um, basically why I, put, why I put that statement in the report, that further interpretation may be attempted if a known DNA sample from a potential source is submitted. Um, at the DCI lab, we like to have um, buckle swabs or swabs of the inner cheek of uh, victims or suspects or a, a blood sample, a blood draw spotted onto a card. Um, there's going to be a lot of DNA in that kind of sample, so we're, we're, we're going to definitely know that we have whoever gave us that sample will have their DNA. Now, a straw collected at a restaurant, um, you know, we don't know, what the, we don't know the history of that straw. Is it like... Uh, straws like they have at Chuck E. Cheese with a box of straws and you've got 20 kids reaching their hands in there grabbing a straw out. You, we can't be as sure that the DNA that we would get from that straw is coming from the person that we want it to come from. And so that's why you suggested that a known sample be obtained? Yes. Um, and in fact, there was another item in this case uh, submitted on the same report, DCI item 51, which was a drinking glass that was collected after being used by Donald Burns. Um, now, on this drinking glass, uh, I had DNA from at least four people on that glass. So that, that just goes to show, um, you know, that sometimes straws aren't the best source of getting somebody's DNA profile from. Um, you just don't know the history of, of that glass, how well it was washed in the kitchen, um, if, you know, who, who else drank out of that glass before it was brought to the, the table to be served. Um, so that, at the DCI lab, we like to have a, a known, usually buckle or blood sample from the person that we're trying to get a DNA profile from. The DNA testing we're using right now is so sensitive. Um, perhaps in the past, we wouldn't have had like the last four people that drank out of that drinking glass, but with the technology we have now, it, it's, it's really sensitive. Regardless, did you uh, see this as you described earlier as unbelievable, um, as a pretty significant break in the case? Yes. 
I want to ask you about some words and terminology you used and explain the results and conclusions. And first, you described the profile that you developed from this straw as weak. Could you explain what that means? Um, a lot of the profiles will have known samples. Um, we're, we're measuring in relative fluorescent units. Like in a known buckle sample, I would expect each of those DNA alleles in a person's profile to be around you know, 4,000 to uh, 10,000 or more relative fluorescent units. Uh, when I say a weak profile, I'm, I'm talking a lot less than that. We're talking about you know, 1,000 fluorescent units or, or less than that, 600. 600 fluorescent units is our stochastic threshold. Um, if we see a peak that's lower than 600, then uh, there's a chance that there's DNA there that's not being detected. It's, there's just not enough there to be, to be, there's not enough copies of there to be detected by our instrument. So we have to be careful with weak DNA data. Um, given that, um, did you still find that you were able to develop enough of a profile there to be confident in your um, assessment that you couldn't eliminate Jerry Burns? Yes. E even though the data was weak, the DNA data that I did have was matching up with the known DNA profile of Jerry Burns. And, uh, to clarify, when I asked that question there, we're talking about the profile developed from the straw Jerry Burns used, not Jerry Burns himself. We haven't gotten to that yet, right? That's right. Is it protocol at the laboratory to have another analyst review your findings? Yes, that's another requirement of the FBI. Anything that I do has to be reviewed by another qualified DNA analyst. It's what we call a technical review. All DNA reports uh, going back to the year 2000 um, have to be reviewed by another qualified analyst before they can be finalized. If you would, uh, since we have this up and we can maybe scroll uh, down the page a little farther here, Explain, if you would, the results that you obtained from uh, item number 53. Okay, I developed a male DNA profile from item 53, which was a toothbrush uh, collected from the garbage of Donald Burns. And whoever's DNA is on that toothbrush is eliminated from the crime scene sample, uh, stain F5. Approach the witness, Your Honor. You may. Be handing the witness what's been previously marked as States Exhibit 11A1. Yeah. Top of this document says uh, PowerPlex, 16 mm -hmm. loci and stats on it. Uh, refers to criminalist Linda Sawyer or Sauer. Do you uh, recognize that document? Yes. And what is that? Uh, this is a copy of the results that Linda Sauer developed in 2005 from stain F5 on the dress. It's the DNA profile that she interpreted um, from that sample. How do you use that in reaching your findings that you compiled in this report that we just, uh, we just looked at? After I developed the DNA, DNA profiles from the straw and the toothbrush, I would take my results and compare them to Linda Sauer's results and just look and see if I had a match or an elimination at each of the uh, 12 areas where she had results for. Are the markings on uh, exhibit uh, 11A1 and contain on that ones that you made on it while you were performing this comparison process? Yeah, this is a copy of Linda's results. So I have some check marks and some OKs, and I've circled some things. I've made my initials. Um, there, you can also see Linda's initials and whoever reviewed Linda Sauer's report at the time, which looks like it would have been Erica Ng. And then also Scott Stockslager's initials at the bottom right corner of this page, he, he reviewed the work that I did in this case. 
is this a fair and accurate copy of a document you used in order to reach your conclusions um, that we just saw in the report 39, States Exhibit 11A? Yes. Is this also a record kept in the regular course of business activity available for uh, discovery purposes and available for review? Yes. Does this actually show you confirming that the profile that you developed from the straw could not be eliminated? Those are my check marks over on the left side of the page as you're going down the loci next to the alleles at each locus. I made those check marks as just an indication to me that it matched what was developed from the straw. And is that helpful then in demonstrating the process that you use to uh, compare the profile you developed from the straw to the crime scene profile F5 developed by Linda? Yes. Okay. Move to admit states 11A1, Your Honor. Have you had an opportunity to review 11A1? I have, Your Honor. If I may uh, question the witness briefly, please. You may. Mr. Schmidt, uh, the notations about which you've just testified on uh, Government's Exhibit 11A1, all of those notations, with the exception of some initials in the bottom right-hand corner, are yours. Is that accurate? Yes, Erica and Scott Stockslegger's initials are in the bottom right corner, and Linda Sowers is in the upper right corner. The rest of the markings are, are mine. And uh, of particular interest to me is the notation that you made in the uh, column dealing uh, the third, the fourth column, the far right column at the bottom where you have written It appears like FBI database do not use. Is that, is, am I reading that accurately? That's correct. And why did you write FBI database do not use? About five years ago, it was discovered in the FBI's database that, that we used to use for statistical calculations. There were errors in that database, some transcription errors. And so uh, that was with the Hispanic population of that database. And so we stopped using that database because basically the calculations are wrong or will be slightly off because the data is not accurate that is in the database. So we, we can't use that, uh, the stats on the Hispanic population for this sample. However, the, st the statistics for the Caucasian and African-American statistics for this sample are okay because we did not use the FBI's database for those population groups. Uh, for those population groups, we used the allele frequencies that were provided by Perkin-Elmer Biosystems based on LabCorp of America's data. And to my knowledge, they did not find any errors in that database. So what year was it uh, that the FBI database was not to be used? For our crime lab, I think it was about 2015 that we uh, started, uh, stopped using that database until corrections were made and we were able to use another database. Well, I believe uh, Linda Sauer testified that she did uh, use that database in 2005. Would that comport with your understanding of the institutional use of that database back in 2005? Yes, uh, we, it, we would report whatever number was smallest uh, in our reports. So if the, f the frequency was found in like one out of 100 billion Caucasians, but it was only found in one out of 400 Hispanics, uh, we would give it the benefit of doubt to the defense, and we would report the, the smaller number, the one out of 400. So. In this case, the Hispanic number was actually higher. Um, it's, a, it's a four with 13 zeros behind it, uh, whereas the number that was used for reporting is what came from the Caucasian database was, is a five with only 12 zeros behind it. So even if uh, she had used the Hispanic numbers at the time, for this particular sample, the Caucasian still gave the, uh, the, the smallest number, and so this still would have been okay to use this, this worksheet. Um, based on that detailed explanation, I have no objections to this exhibit. Uh, the court will receive 
uh, states 11A1, is that where we are? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, the court will receive that and make it part of the record. Uh, and on that note, we are going to give everyone a break. We're in thick in science class, so we're going to give everybody about a 15-minute <laughs> break. Okay? Please bear in mind that admonition, folks.